here. Okay. Uh, so, Eugene, thank you so much for your time and for your willingness to be interviewed. It's just gonna be a short interview. Uh, I believe a lot of my friends know about you already because I talk a lot about you on my Instagram. So, but can you like introduce yourself uh, for sure? Yeah. So I'm Eugene Nagasawa. I'm professor of philosophy and Kingfisher College Chair of the Philosophy, Religion, and Ethics at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, I specialize in the philosophy of religion and the philosophy of mind. Uh, I have written books about the existence of God, uh, miracles, science and religion, uh, the problem of consciousness, and so on. And I really like to explore the bigger questions in philosophy. And you recent, your, your book recently published, it's The Problem of Evil for Atheists, right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's my latest book. And it's an open access title. So mm -hmm. if you want to download the whole book as a PDF file, then you can do it. So you can go to the website of Oxford University Press and you can just search The Problem of, e of Evil for Atheists. Yeah, all right. I'll, I'll let them know the link later. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just want to start with the questions. I'm going to start with a very simple questions, but I like these questions a lot. So what's so great about philosophy? I love philosophy because in this uh, field, we can explore all kinds of questions, mm -hmm. fundamental questions, uh, which people in other fields wouldn't even consider. So maybe historians talk about a specific historical event. Mm -hmm. But philosophers question something much deeper. So they can ask, you know, whether the past exists, or, mm -hmm, yeah. um, you know, whether it's possible to time travel, <laughs> you know, those, those <laughs> crazy questions. Uh -huh. uh, I feel liberated to do philosophy because in philosophy, you can raise all kinds of questions and no one would, would say you're stupid <laughs> because you, you propose some un un unusual thesis. But of course, there's a responsibility. Mm -hmm. So when you propose a, a new idea, you have to defend it. You have to present an argument for it. And when people find your argument uncompelling, and then they can conclude that you know, your view is untenable. But until then, you, know, you can defend anything you would like. And that, that's, that's a, a nice thing about philosophy. I uh, yeah, I like the way you describe this greatness about philosophy. You know, a lot of philosophers have their own reasons for the greatness of philosophy and I think you propose that explorations is one of the great things about philosophy am I right yeah I think you said that you like crazy ideas oh, yeah, and I like right. crazy <laughs> ideas as well so uh -huh. you know different conceptions of God uh -huh. uh, you know why there is something rather than nothing and you know we try to come up with all all kinds of um, novel uh, hypotheses and you know we have freedom to explore these hypotheses mm -hmm. which is a nice thing about philosophy because yeah. it's not as if there are already established theories that we must accept mm -hmm. we can question absolutely anything in philosophy interesting yeah one of my professors ex-professors is uh, T.D. Smith mm -hmm. and he wrote in animism and right. I really love that yeah that's <laughs> a good, a good example <laughs> yeah. yeah you cannot say oh animism is crazy so we, we don't need to consider uh -huh. you know, if there are good philosophical yeah. arguments for animism we have to take it seriously mm -hmm. now my, my other questions relating but not entirely but what advice would you give to aspiring philosophers hmm. uh, the first thing that I would say is that you know we should develop diverse perspectives uh, hmm. when you are in a certain group or even a specific country you know you tend to form a specific way of thinking right. about things but in philosophy we are addressing fundamental questions so we really need diverse perspectives so it's very important for young people young philosophers to travel out around and speak to philosophers from different ways of doing philosophy and different perspectives and different styles and i think that's very important uh, another important thing is to think and write clearly. Mm -hmm. I think people have this stereotype that philosophical texts are meant to be profound <laughs> yeah. and yeah. difficult and uh -huh. arcane. But I think philosophical texts should be exactly the opposite. You know, the purpose of philosophy is to clarify our ideas about difficult questions. So philosophers need to think clearly and write clearly. 
Okay, nice. I, I like that as well. So, um, I came into philosophy first through existentialism. Mm -hmm. It is, of course, great existentialism, but it's like it's overlaps with some kind of literature, like novel, and I end up growing up. Uh, I'm not hating, but I'm no longer with existentialism so much, and I preferred that kind of that analytical analytical style of mm. writing mm. Uh, clear mm. direct so yeah so that's my experience yeah. yeah some analytic philosophers are hostile towards continental philosophy that's right. yeah. <clears throat> but my view is that you know there are so many different ways of doing philosophy continental philosophy is one one approach mm -hmm. analytic yeah, philosophy yeah. is an, another approach i like analytic philosophy because again i like clear thinking yeah. and you know when we face complex issues and analytic philosophers can clarify you know, right. what, what are hidden assumptions and what are conceptions that we should be adopting. You know, it re it's really eye-opening and I, I like that aspect of analytic philosophy. All right, this, this is great. So talking about analytic philosophy, it is interesting that, interesting that I'm currently in your class, Meaning of Life. Well, that's one of the issues that a lot of analytic philosophers mm -hmm. will say you you couldn't say anything there mm -hmm. you shouldn't talk about it so i wonder what makes this topic especially for you as a philosopher so you know what makes it so interesting mm -hmm. yeah so the meaning of life has been discussed mainly by continental philosophers yeah. as you mentioned there's this great uh, existentialist tradition and many analytic philosophers uh, especially when logical positivism was very influential, people thought that you know the meaning of life is not something that mm -hmm. we should be discussing yeah. uh, because it's pointless to talk about it. But now there's a growing literature on the meaning of life mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in analytic philosophy. And I think analytic philosophy is particularly useful here because the, the big concept of the meaning of life can be quite obscure. So it's very helpful to appeal to resources in analytic, analytic philosophy to figure out you know, exactly what we are talking about. Uh, what do you mean by meaning and how meaning is related to other concepts like death mm -hmm. and God and uh, transcendence and those things. Mm -hmm. So I think analytic philosophers can make significant contributions to this field. And it's quite exciting to see that over the last 15, 20 years, there have been a lot of great analytic philosophers participating in the debate. Mm -hmm. And you, I heard, have some ideas regarding one of the issues that they talk in The Meaning of Life, which is about immortality. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you mind to sharing about it? Yeah, so I received an email from someone who read some of my papers, and he said that he suffers from uh, thanatophobia, which is the mm -hmm. fear of death, which is very common, I yeah. think. Uh, so he's scared of death. But what's interesting is that he also said that he is scared of immortality as well. Mm. So he has aperophobia, the fear of immortality mm -hmm. or infinity. So he wanted to figure out what, what's happening. Uh, and then, yeah, so I thought about you know, whether or not whether or not immortality is desirable. Mm -hmm. It's not about whether or not immort we are actually immortal. Uh -huh. okay. So do we want to be immortal or not? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people raise this kind of question. Some of them would say, oh, if I live for 90 years or 100 years, that, that's more than enough. I don't want to live forever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And other people would say, you know, oh, I, I love life and you know, I want to live forever if it's, that's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but my answer to this question is to say, you know, we can't really answer it unless we specify exactly what kind of immortality we are talking about. Uh -huh. Because it's possible that you are immortal, but you have to suffer forever, and that kind of immortality is undesirable. Uh, but if you can enjoy uh, pleasure, you, you can have pleasure and bliss for eternally, of course we would, we would want, want that. So if you make <laughs> yeah. a ranking of different forms of mortality <laughs> yeah. and immortality, there's a mixture of good immortality, uh -huh. bad immortality, good mortality, and bad immortality. So my conclusion is that there is no general answer to the question whether or not we should desire immortality. I think this is related as well with the idea of we need 
a lot of perspectives mm -hmm. in talking about philosophy and yeah. one of the thing is immortality a lot of perspective there exactly yeah so if you look at different religious and cultural traditions you can find many different forms of immortality uh, in buddhism hinduism christianity you can find different uh, different beliefs yeah. in immortality so we cannot ge just generally ask you know do you want to be immortal yeah all right heavy stuff there so i'm wondering this is my last question yeah. uh well you struggle with a lot of questions big stuff and sometimes i don't know but sometimes it's like despairing quote unquote mm -hmm. <laughs> so i wonder have you ever grown tired of philosophy given the sometimes weird and fascinating questions of it mm -hmm. yeah. yeah philosophy can be quite intense mm -hmm. uh so when you philosophize things sometimes it's very overwhelming so sometimes you know, I read uh, trash, trashy <laughs> novels or watch silly films uh -huh. just to relax my brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but overall, I think I feel very fortunate to uh, make a living from uh, exploring philosophical questions. Mm -hmm. I, I feel I'm very privileged that uh, I can actually make a living from teaching philosophy mm -hmm. to bright young people and write philosophy books. And mm -hmm. I think that's an amazing thing to do. So I. Overall, I never get tired of philosophy. <laughs> there are always yeah. really interesting philosophical questions uh -huh. that you can uh, explore. Yeah. I remember last time when we had dinner with Hunter, Hunter said, I'm never tired of philosophy, I'm just tired. So yeah, <laughs> maybe that's <laughs> yes. what you explore. Yeah, you can be just physically tired, <laughs> but you can never get tired of philosophy if you love philosophy. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I'm just a master student, but I already felt the excitement of like reading and writing only philosophy and i'm really enjoying it so yeah it is a privilege but yeah yeah <laughs> that's brilliant yeah it's an intellectual luxury luxury right. to explore these questions that might not have very significant practical implications but mm -hmm. there are very important questions yeah. for our existence yeah so i think that's all the questions that i want to ask uh you did thank you again for the 12 minutes of this interview it's really great uh and i really hope this will help you guys who are interested with philosophy and also who's I have some friends, some followers who already say that uh, Samuel, do you think it's worth it to do philosophy? So it will be nice if like this kind of video will uh, make you more certain about whether to take philosophy or not, hopefully. So Eugene, thanks again Thank for you. the interview. Thank you so much.